You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. Hey guys, super excited about this episode. We are getting the opportunity to speak with Crystal Law and Laura Goodman from Junior Achievement. And to be honest with you, if you have been listening to the show for the past, I would say six months or so, you have heard us mention multiple times that we have been working with Junior Achievement. You know, we talk about why don't they teach this information to kids? This idea of financial literacy, why didn't I learn about this in school? This incredible organization with a history that is more than 100 years old has been dedicated to that cause, and this is happening. And so kind of being able to slow down on that, find out where did they start, what are they doing, what are they doing now, and how can we help is really the heart of this episode. And help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I'm doing quite well. And yeah, you're exactly right. This organization, Junior Achievement, is a kindred spirit to Choose a Fi, to the Fi community, and to anyone who wants to further financial literacy anywhere. So really excited to learn more about it. And it's neat. I actually, my daughters came home this year and they had an in-class lesson from someone from Junior Achievement. And that was the first time I'd heard of JA. And then we had Ed from our organization volunteer at one of the finance parks. And then you and I drove up to Northern Virginia, volunteered at one of the finance parks. So this is something that we are trying to really foster here at Chooseify is working hand in hand as volunteers for Junior Achievement. So with that, Lauren Crystal, welcome to the Choose a Buy podcast. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, glad to be here. Good morning. So let me introduce you individually to our audience. Crystal Law, I believe, make sure I have your, your title and your role at Junior Achievements correct. You're the Senior Manager of Program Implementation and Support. Is that correct? Actually, with the new fiscal year, I am the Director of Financial Literacy Experiences. So taking on an expanded role uh, within the education group at JUSA. Fantastic. And Laura, you are the Vice President of Volunteer Engagement. That is correct. Awesome. And tell us practically, what does that mean? As the Vice President of Volunteer Engagement, I live in a really cool world within the national office. Not only do I get to work cross-functionally with the different departments at the national office, for example, I work a lot with our development group on potential new partnerships that may include volunteerism, funding, sponsorship, I work closely with Crystal and her team to ensure that the volunteer remains an integral part of everything that Junior Achievement does. And I get to work with our network of 106 JA area offices to support them on their volunteer efforts. Uh, That can include volunteer recruitment, volunteer training resources, any type of strategy and support that they need. So uh, I'm kind of all over the place and I love it. Laura, how much of JA is volunteer-driven versus JA employees? At the national office, which is based in Colorado Springs, Colorado, we have about 80 associates that sit in the building running that operation. Crystal and I represent our field remote associates for the national office, and there's about 25 of us. So a little over 100 folks working for the national office. Our network of local area associates, we have, I'd say more than 1,500 local J area associates. But then we rely on volunteer support for everything that we do. That could be in terms of the local board of directors who really help our local J area office leaders set strategy, not only in terms of fundraising strategy, but program implementation strategy. And then our programs are taught by volunteers and they're truly the backbone of what we do Uh, They're the reason we exist, and they're really what differentiate Junior Achievement from any other organization. We work with a network of nearly 250,000 volunteers that reach over 4.8 million students. So volunteers are significant to what we do. Wow, that's incredible. So the reason we exist, Crystal, I'd actually like to slow down on that and talk about a, a JA origin story, an organization, a nonprofit dedicated to financial literacy that's over 100 years old. 
What does that look like at inception? We are really celebrating our centennial this year, and we've been founded on three pillars, actually started with our J company program in the after school to bring students in a time of changing industry to learn more about business and how companies function with their products and services. So building on that entrepreneurship pillar, JA also focuses on work and career readiness and of course, financial literacy. So I'd say in the past few years, our education group at JUSA really has evolved our program development and redevelopment process, looking at a different way of thinking and incorporating design thinking and our an innovation cycle to really work with the J area network and foster different types of development, work off of feedback and local projects that the areas have built. Basically, J area offices have taken a lot of our programs and customized them based on the local needs and the changing landscape of financial literacy. They even create their own content and events. We call them R&D. So based on taking all of the developments, the R&D, we're looking at what we can really offer to our students and school partners. So all of our financial literacy content and programming has connection and support to national and state curriculum standards, along with meeting the school and business partner needs. So Chris, I'm curious, you so national and state standards. Is JA in all 50 states? I know Laura said it, you're working with over 4 million students a year. How does that work? Is it truly state by state? Is it nationwide? Like how, how does JA partner with local jurisdictions, state, et cetera? Yeah, so we have 106 offices across the U.S., so I do believe we are at least one office in every state. So it's fun. We really get to talk to folks in different time zones, and area offices work with their local community ecosystem to drive what programming and determine what programming best meets the needs of their schools, their business, their other volunteers, community partners. So it really is driven um, at the local level based on markets. One of the things I'm generally interested in is what is the, the most exciting thing that Junior Achievements is really focusing on right now? And the reason I'm curious about that is to kind of, con- like with every business, with every nonprofit, just things and focuses shift over time, things iterate. Junior Achievements, when it first started, was it focused on the same things that it's focused on now? We started with one program, and I mentioned a day company program, and it was after school. It meant for students to learn more about business, create a product or service, and actually get a chance to sell it, go through those steps, basically, of a business startup. Over the decades, it has evolved. In the 90s, we added some capstone programs, namely J Finance Park and J BizTown. And that's kind of where I got started learning about J Finance Park focused on students getting immersed hands-on with financial literacy and learning all about budgeting and saving. Our program suite has continued to evolve. We have over 20 programs across elementary through high school and with all of the local areas based on their content and feedback, we've been able to add on even more new programs in the past couple of years to have a robust set of program offerings. No, that's interesting. So it sounded like you were saying there at origin, really, it was entrepreneurship driven. So it was a way to help individuals come up with a business plan. Is that accurate? Yes, absolutely. And who was the target age for, for, was it, was it kids in school? Yes. Kids in high school, after school setting, uh, only chance to really get to the students and offer them some additional learning before they'd go out in the world. And then at some point, uh, and, and I believe I heard you mention in the 90s, that's when the, the finance parks really became available and financial literacy, was that added on top of the entrepreneur bent or was there a, a dramatic shift in the focus and realizing that kids needed more of just a basic financial literacy? There were some in-school programs earlier before the capstone programs started that offered financial literacy and work readiness concepts, but it was all in school. Again, it was a shorter experience. When we started the Capstone J Finance Park and J Biz Town experiences, it became really robust. It offered both teacher-led curriculum in the classroom, and then it led to an on-site or virtual simulation where students got to spend the day hands-on, really applying what they've learned in the classroom. Laura, anything to add? You know, I think two things I'd add is one, as a serious point, 
I think the focus that Jay started on, focusing on student success, making students successful for their future, was really a core idea of what our founders, Horace Moses and Theodore Vail, were intending to do. As society was shifting from an agrarian society to an industrial society, knowing that we had to start making students work ready without even really knowing that buzzword 100 years ago, that was their intent. And that is still the intent of junior achievement is making our students ready for whatever's next. And that might be straight into the workforce. It could be straight into a a trade school, a vocational school, post-secondary, whatever their path is, we have a role in, in helping to shape them. One fun fact I love about JA, and I love when Crystal, our colleagues, talk about this. We have so many colleagues who have been with Junior Achievement for their entire career. And I'm talking 25, 30, 35, 40, 45 years. Our CEO has been with Junior Achievement for 45 years. And I love hearing their stories, but I love hearing that JA was really some of the first people to bring a computer into the classroom. Um, We hear stories about local JA program managers having to haul in these huge computers to run some of our first programs. And it was the first time schools were seeing computers and technology. And I think there's something there that we were the first ones to bring that into the classroom. And like Crystal's talked about, our education team is doing so many innovative programs and approaches to programming and approaches to innovation. It's coming full circle. We're now some of the first to bring technology back into the classroom or bring it in a new way or interact with the students in a new way. And so I think that full circle experience has been really cool to to witness not only coming in as a JA student myself, then a JA staff member, and then just really kind of watching how our history has evolved. Laura, you said in there, interact with students in a, in a new way. And I'm curious, this is something, a, a very broad question. So many people shut off mentally when it comes to money or personal finance. If, if they feel overwhelmed or they don't know anything about it. But do you have any tips from the JA perspective on what really works to get through to people, to get people excited about personal finance? I think this is something that so many people in the FI community, they we want to talk to our friends and our neighbors and our family about this. And sometimes just that first little thing, it's hard to get over that hump to to make this a conversation you can actually broach. Do you have any tips? Yeah, so I think there's two perspectives. As a JA volunteer, um, knowing, as Crystal said, we focus on three content areas and financial literacy is one of those. That means that financial literacy is being talked about in everything that we do from kindergarten to 12th grade. And so let's let's look at it from the volunteer perspective. So we've recruited a volunteer who believes in JA and is excited to go into that second grade classroom or that seventh grade classroom or that 12th grade classroom, but they don't know how to start the conversation. The great thing is JA has outlined that conversation for you. As Crystal talked about, our programs are correlated to the education stuff that teachers are required to get into their classrooms, that they're expecting. So we're covering those bases. But our content is written so that it approaches a topic with students and it gauges what they already know about it. So you're opening the session with a question. How many of you have ever gone with your parent or guardian or friend to the bank? Show of hands. Okay, what was that like? So you start a conversation and then the materials really guide you through that conversation. And if you go in and you get stage fright and you're not sure what to say or when to say it, the guide is going to do that. If you go into a classroom and you've connected and you're really feeling it and you're owning that role, the guide is going to say, tell the students about a time when you went into the bank or when you opened your first checking account. What we love about what we do is, again, that volunteer is the secret ingredient. And so while they can go in and read from our material and teach straightforward and it still be a really great class. We really encourage volunteers to flavor the content with their own personal and professional experiences and examples. And that's really what brings it to life. Crystal and I have been working on a project to explore new volunteer models. And one of the models we tested, ultimately, we decided this is a volunteer delivery strategy and it's storytelling. It's how to get a volunteer to tell a story so that it engages the students. It makes them curious and wants them to learn more. And what has been so great is uh, two weeks ago, we were at our national leadership conference, and there was this resounding theme of storytelling throughout a presentation by our own brand group and a presentation from donors who are really strong partners with Junior Achievement. They were talking about storytelling, and I came up to Crystal later, and I said, "We, we like hit this on the head. Like We were working on this before we even knew it was a common theme. And so starting that conversation, being able to tell a story and get people comfortable and related is great. The other thing I would share is that I can remember as a local JA program manager, I can remember recruiting some volunteers and training them. 
and they happened to be college students and they were going into an elementary classroom. And when I was going through the JE content with them, she stopped me and she said, do you guys teach this for college students? And I said, no, unfortunately we don't. We typically stop after 12th grade. And she said, my roommate and I have no idea. We're always talking about how to save our money and how we're supposed to get through college. And she's like, we both, we had no exposure to this. And wouldn't it be great if we could learn this ourselves? So I think there's so many different ways to come at it. It's a very important conversation, obviously one important to junior achievement, one important to us personally, but those are two examples of how I would respond to starting that conversation. No, I love that. And I love the emphasis on storytelling as well. I think story drives everything and where academia can sometimes be a tough sell. If you can weave a story into it, it's so much more compelling. I think that desire for people that have, you know, who've had the benefit, the luxury of having a strong financial backbone, strong financial literacy, you see their heart with kind of passing it on to the next generation. I think Junior Achievements has done an incredible job providing a platform for volunteers to engage. Crystal, I want to come back and talk to you. You know, if I feel like with Laura's story, what she was just talking about, college students saying, why don't they teach it to us in some varying degree? And I feel like what Junior Achievements has done an incredible job at a grassroots level organizing the volunteers. I'm wondering if you look at it more at a macro level, it seems like even in the political discussion, there's more of a sense of urgency of we need to be supporting this type of curriculum. Are you seeing that at the highest levels in terms of getting more support now than maybe you have over the past several years. I just feel like there's an uptick in the amount of focus and energy that's being put into, we need to be teaching our our kids this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I think coupled with our hundred year history, talking and focusing on our three pillars, which we always have, we've started a new initiative in the past year called JA Pathways. And it's really a strategic approach to be a better solution provider across all of our different JA area offices. It's actually really just a natural outgrowth of our past, but it's thinking more strategically, being a stronger partner with our local school districts and businesses allowing students to have a focus in what we call competencies for each of our three pillars, again, financial literacy, entrepreneurship, and work and career readiness, identifying those competencies as key critical components to being successful in our increasing you know, global economy. It's a competitive and changing landscape. So right now, for financial literacy in particular, students can focus on mastering competencies Uh, We can also use those competencies to do an analysis and identify gaps or opportunities to build new content or better align to students' needs, again, meeting national and local curriculum standards as well as mandates. Uh, We've heard more and more that financial literacy is required as part of a high school graduation. I believe over 20 states now have a financial literacy mandate. So we've been working very closely with a lot of the local areas to make sure they have the content they need for their schools. Crystal, I asked a similar question to Laura about how to get people excited about personal finance in general. But I'm curious from the financial literacy perspective and maybe like a curriculum or like how to how to approach this. Are there items that you've found that work as a gateway to get people in to get them excited about it? Yeah, absolutely. I can share a personal experience. I found out about junior achievement as a volunteer. I had been working in banking, you know, no previous experience teaching whatsoever. The volunteer coordinator had reached out, said, hey, there's a program for third grade about budgeting. It's called JR City. So I'm like, sure, I'll volunteer in the classroom. So I went week over week for an hour at a time. They gave us the training. They gave us the materials. And what I really found about the program kit that I was equipped with, all of the materials, all of the volunteer guides, it was really turnkey. Everything was laid out, as Laura mentioned. You know, As long as I read that guide or had it in my hand, I would be prepared with the talking points and the prompts, the discussion questions. I felt comfortable having a conversation with, you know, little eight and nine year olds in the classroom when I had never done that before. Another fun piece about the program kit is that it offered all of the activities, you know, laid out for you. And so going in as a volunteer in the classroom, taking something fun, you know, learning about what it means to save um, and having students talking about what they've saved for and doing an activity or watching a video. I found that to be really engaging and just a fun, approachable way for the students to relate to these big concepts and just be able to take it home to share with their parents and families too. Yeah, that's cool. Now, what about from the student's perspective? I'm sure having worked as a volunteer for 
for so long, like you've seen them have that aha moment. Are there any items that stick out in particular that you noticed more often than not really lit kids up and, and made them excited about it? Oh my gosh. Yes. I think, you know, getting the chance throughout any of the JA programs that we offer students being able to think about, make a decision on their own and apply their knowledge. You really see their eyes light up. The light bulb moment comes on. And I know what, for example, when I worked with the JA finance park program in a local JA area, middle and high school students would come to our facility for the one day simulation. They would basically put on their adult hats. We'd give them a scenario in which they were maybe married with children. They were working, had jobs, and they had to go through a budgeting scenario through the day. The students came in thinking it was going to be a boring day, a lot of math. They were going to write on a bunch of handouts and just sit down and work on worksheets. But they got to actually move around, um, explore different budget categories by visiting different shops, learning more from their volunteer about what it means to pay for your water and sewer and trash every month, um, and really think about the needs of their family, their fictional families. So I always remember at the end of the finance park day, students would share feedback with their volunteers. We'd share feedback out to the whole group. And they were like, wow, you know, I can't believe I had no idea. I'm going to go home and thank my mom and dad because I had no idea how many budget items I had going on in a household. I had no idea that we had to pay for our water and sewer and, you know, someone to take out the trash every month. Those aha moments, we heard it firsthand. That's what keeps me going with junior achievement every day because the students grasp those and be able to apply it and you know, remember it, take it with them as they move forward, uh, going to college and beyond. That's absolutely wild. Just because as Brad was asking the question, I was internally answering it and it was our experience almost verbatim. We went to the finance park in DC. It was an incredible <laughs> opportunity watching those kids for the first time, putting together a budget. First of all, being given a, a life, they, you're, you're assigned, you know, this profile of how much you make, what it is that you do. And after you work through that, how much you have to spend and then realize, wait, I have to pay to have my trash taken out. That's a line item on a budget. And kind of working through that and just seeing, getting a sense for what actually life costs. Well, why wouldn't I own three houses? Why wouldn't I have three cars? Why? Oh, because, because I only have so much and I have to plan for all these variables that I didn't know really existed. It was, it's definitely one of those light bulb moments that it's difficult to unsee if you're a kid. And I think that the finance park did a remarkable job giving the child basically the autonomy to fail, you know, if you will, like the freedom to fail but in through that process, potentially fix it and realize what did it what did it look like to get a budget that actually worked by the end. And to do that, you had to account for all these line items that, as you pointed out, rightly so, you just take for granted. You don't even know that they're a thing. Absolutely. And like you said, the volunteer being there for the day, working with small groups of students, adding additional color to their experience by sharing their own, you know, personal stories and letting them know, hey, I failed at budgeting or saving for this item one time. Here's how you can relate or think about what I did and put yourself in my shoes. So it's a fun experience. Yeah. And certainly better to fail as quote unquote fail, jokingly, as an eighth grader going through this budgeting scenario than when they're 22, 23, and they're getting themselves into debt. I absolutely love that. That was my big takeaway from our day at the finance park. I wanted to make a, a just a slight pivot on here and just ask you, just because we are, we are a podcast that dedicates the bandwidth of our show, the heart of our soul to promoting this concept of financial independence, which I think, you know, in our somewhat biased minds is the most exciting thing to happen in the personal finance community ever. I and mean, it's just, it seems like once you see it, it's an obvious choice. I'm curious for you, has the concept of financial independence popped up on your plate just generally? And what is your perspective on it? Yes, absolutely. I think it comes up <laughs> a lot more often now, especially with our work on J Pathways. I think it's really all about the path or journey towards financial independence. You know, we teach financial literacy. It's really that first step for anyone, whether you're a student or an adult, to have and gain the knowledge and skills about managing your financial resources, right? We've seen a lot of trends in the shift from financial literacy to financial capability. So really, you know, taking all the knowledge and skills, having the attitude and making the decision, the, the conscious choice to change your behavior and take action and making better and smarter money management decisions. And then finally, I think achieving financial well-being or financial independence, really that state where anyone can fully meet their 
current, their future financial obligations, you know, really feel secure in their financial futures and be happy as they move forward in their lives. That's fantastic. And yeah, I love how you actually, the, the verbiage there, the very specific verbiage, financial literacy has to act as a foundation. And what that allows you to access is financial capability. And if you think about these in terms of building blocks at some point, you know, financial independence, that point in time in which the passive gains from your investments can cover the cost of your daily expenses. I think one of the things that I'm very interested in is the finance park we mentioned very specifically, but I know JA has several pathways and several programs. When it comes to financial literacy, you have these finance park, but you also have opportunities inside the classroom. And I'd be curious if you could do a little compare and contrast about those programs that are targeting financial literacy. What are the opportunities for volunteers? Sure. So our foundational programs, and I'll talk a little bit about programs and then toss it to Laura as well. But in terms of financial literacy programs, really our foundation is grades K through five. Those elementary programs do focus on either financial literacy, work readiness, or entrepreneurship. I think in middle and high school, we start to see more in-class and after-school and capstone type experiences that expand on and go deeper into the knowledge and skills that students need for financial literacy concepts like employment and income, you know, really getting to explore different job and career options and understanding what's the earnings potential associated with each of those. Of course, we talked about the big budgeting, saving and spending, how to really make smart financial decisions, learning more about different types of financial institutions and bank accounts understanding types of insurance, how to protect one's financial identity, prevent identity fraud and theft. And of course, talking about investing, different economic concepts that impact finance and just showing awareness of charity or philanthropy in society and your local community. So those are some high level concepts across all of our programs. So Laura, I'm curious, obviously, we have many tens upon tens of thousands of people listening to this. And These are people excited about getting involved, about financial literacy, about financial independence. How can they work with JA? I know we started this 12-city beta program where we would have volunteers work with you at, at finance parks, but it's possible well beyond that, right? So give us a sense of, I guess, the different volunteer opportunities and then how members of the Choose of I community can get involved. So in terms of, um, I guess, the portfolio of of volunteer experiences, they really do range. And not to sound cliche or cheesy here, the thing that I believe Junior Achievement is great about is that we offer turnkey volunteer experiences. And what what I mean by that is we're plug and play. We have everything put together for you. Our local staff is going to provide training for you. They're going to provide support throughout your experience and hopefully keep you engaged once the experience is over. In terms of what volunteerism can look like, again, it's our local staff's job and focus to really get to understand what it is that your local Choose FI group members, maybe an individual, is looking for. Or if you have a group that's wanting to come together in a city and volunteers a group, our staff is really going to talk with you about what you're looking for. Is it something that you want to go in together and do over the course of a couple of hours? Is it something that one person's wanting to do one hour, one time, and then be done? And so when we talk about volunteering for JA, we typically categorize it into a couple of buckets. Our first little category we refer to is traditional in-class volunteer experiences. And that's when volunteers go to a classroom session by session. So that might be once a week, twice a week, whatever. Um, Again, your members have told our local staff members, and then we've matched up with an uh, opening in a classroom Uh, in a school. But they're teaching a JA session one at a time, typically 30 to 45 minutes each time, depending on how long the session is. We also have JA in a days, which are great for groups. And I know we've talked about having some of your larger Choose FI groups come together to go into some of those finance parks or JA biz towns, or even to go into a school and take on an entire grade level or an entire grade. But in those situations, your members will be teaching an entire JA program in a one-day setting, and that's typically a four- to six-hour commitment. Again, training is provided, all the materials are available, and you're going in to facilitate the lesson and engage the students in learning. We've talked about Capstone over and over, that JA Finance Park, JA Biz Town. That, again, is a couple of hours that your members would be committing to junior achievement to go in and guide the students through their simulation. The classroom teacher has taught the curriculum ahead of time for those two programs. So when the students come on site to that facility and, again, are either presented with their 
fictional life simulation that uh, Crystal talked about, or at BizTown, they're given a job within uh, BizTown, and the volunteers are guiding them through. They're coaching them. They're answering questions. They're having the students think through what some decision-making steps might be. And then we have other experiences. So if you have local members looking to get entrenched and teach programs like JA Company Program, where our students are thinking through coming up with a business and creating a product and selling it, we have those experiences. We have JA Job Shadows. We have local JA Inspire events where people are talking to students about career opportunities. We have local speaker series. You know, we really have everything under the sun. And I think that's what becomes really fun about getting involved with Junior Achievement is for us to get to know what it is you're interested in. We obviously know that you guys are looking at financial literacy, but even at that, looking at all the programs and all the experiences that fall under that umbrella and then finding what makes the most sense for your members to get involved, what their time commitment looks like, what age groups they want to work with, and what's really going to ignite them to be excited to volunteer with Junior Achievement. Awesome. Well, just for our listeners, if they're hearing this, I just want to interject this real quick. If you're in our audience and you're interested in partnering with us as we try to help JA in any way that we can, uh, we've set up a short link on our website. You can go to chooseify.com slash JA, chooseify.com slash JA. Laura, I guess I will direct this to you. Actually, Crystal, it's probably a better question for you. I'm curious from a student experience perspective, because we're, we're going to have uh, we're going to have people in this audience that are administrators of schools, people in this audience that have kids in schools that have JA programs, people in this audience that have kids that are schools that don't currently participate with JA. First of all, for a child that is getting a full-fledged JA experience where the school is partnering with Junior Achievement and the volunteers are at full capacity and they can offer absolutely just the perfect setup, how many interactions would that child have with, you know, a JA financial literacy curriculum? How many touch points would you expect? Yeah. So I think if a a student has junior achievement in one year, I'm going to say that our exposure to JA could range from, let's say five to 10, knowing there could be some experiences that were a one hour experience, but majority of our students are getting a concrete program. That's at least five contact hours is what we call it. As the students get older and the programs get a little more in-depth, obviously the time a volunteer spends with them is a bit longer. And now Crystal's team is developing teacher-led courses like JE Economics, where you're looking at a semester-long course. The great thing about our federated structure is that our local JE areas really work with their education ecosystem and their JE board of directors to determine what is their strategy. I think in years past, we've kind of done a shotgun approach to junior achievement and whatever school wants it can get it. And here it is. But over the last several years, as Junior Achievement USA is taking a much more in-depth look at evaluating our programs, um, really assessing student knowledge gain and skill change and attitudinal change, our areas are coming on board to see that having that set strategy is really beneficial. And now it can start to align with the pathways concept that our education team is rolling out. And so it does vary by area, but we are seeing more and more areas who are saying we're going to be intentional in this district or in this county that every student in third, fifth, seventh, ninth, you know, whatever the grade mapping looks like, that they're going to get that consistent and consecutive dose of junior achievement throughout their career. So it does change by area, but I would say we're starting to see a really strategic shift in how our markets are looking at that student impact. Awesome. Now I do have a question for you just about, cause you mentioned, you know, if parents want to get a sense for um, what sort of resources are, are available, do you have resources at junior achievement that are directly targeted towards parents that want to share financial literacy concepts with their kids? So I'll briefly speak to this. This is Laura. And then I'll certainly go back to Crystal. Our programs do have take home pieces that will tell a parent or a guardian that, you know, junior achievement came to your class or your children's class. Um, and here's what we talked about. We have an excellent website called jamyway.org that anyone can go to. Users do create a profile and go through a little bit of a personality uh, assessment for the the site to kind of say, here's what we heard from you. And it looks like you're interested in the following types of careers. And then that's going to expose a student to career clusters and ideas for scholarships and grants. And so parents can absolutely get onto that website and explore that. Again, as a part of the Pathways movement that our education team is creating taking a look at not only the student journey, the volunteer journey, the educator journey, but now the parent journey is going to be really important to what we do as we look at ways to allow students to access JA outside of the classroom. So if a student happens upon JA just by Googling it or just by typing in, 
want to know more about financial literacy, they may come to JA now and have a way to start getting curriculum um, and information. And that would include the parents being involved as well. So Crystal, anything you'd want to add to that? Yeah, no, I think, Laura, you covered pretty much all of it. But I did want to add with some of the take home pieces, we've been trying to be more thoughtful in the past couple of years based on area feedback. So in some of the take home pieces, we have some additional links to videos and even we've explored augmented reality. We have an app called J Interactive for some of the elementary programs. So students in their their take home pieces can further explore with their families just more on financial literacy concepts in a fun interactive way through videos and AR. Hey, real quick question. Jonathan and I have been blown away by the JA finance parks that we have visited. So we visited one in the DC suburbs and then one here in Richmond. I'm curious, how many do you have nationwide? And is that something that you're building more finance parks or are you at the number right now? How How is that going to work? Yeah. So there is a readiness process that our area offices go through, but our J finance park program is and simulation are actually under redevelopment right now. We're looking to make it a broader suite across middle and high school. And that redevelopment includes both redeveloping the or updating the curriculum along with a virtual online simulation that we had that's pretty dated. So we're looking to completely update that and revamp it along with our on-site simulation uh, with some new, you know, engaging and components and having the students go through a broader span of an adult life, not just, you know, one snapshot, but going from, you know, a teenager all the way to getting ready for retirement. So look forward to more information there. Nice. Now, Crystal, I know you were recently on stage giving a presentation on updates to the financial literacy program. Any uh, teasers that you want to give us? or audience Yeah, that's coming up? absolutely. We've been busy um, in the space and redevelopments and, the, and updates in the past couple of years. So we have a new J economics program. It moved from a kit-based program to blended. A really a lot of work went into that. It's a teacher-led, a semester-long course, but there is, of course, a volunteer component where volunteers can serve as subject matter experts, participate in some of the course content along with a case study or a project. Uh, We're really excited now that the J Economics course is completely blended, so online components. And for the first time ever, we have a student ebook available. Teachers in our pilot have said how exciting that was for students. They literally view it on their mobile phone or their tablet, and it's just very helpful for them to have as they're going through the course. Fantastic. All right. Well, on most shows, that would be the end of the episode. But on this show, Crystal and Laura, we would love to give you the chance to tackle the hot seat. Are you ready for this? Let's do it. Yes. In a world drowning in debt and rampant consumption, trapped by the chains of lifestyle inflation, these questions highlight the secrets of those who have broken free. Welcome to the Choose FI Hot Seat. Question number one, your favorite blog of all time. And really, you can expand this out, your favorite podcast, a book, whatever, your favorite resource of all time. So it's actually not a blog, but favorite book (laughs) of all time. I'm a big fiction fan, so I'd have to say the Harry Potter series, True Millennial. But out of all of them, Goblet of Fire is probably my favorite in the series. I just, you know, there's so many valuable lessons and stories, and I could basically reread them anytime. So I have to go with that. Oh, that is fantastic. Yeah, you were speaking to my soul there. Actually, my, my older daughter just turned 11. And she is reading the Harry Potter series for the first time. And I'm so envious to go back to a point in life where it's so exciting and I knew nothing about it. <laughs> it's amazing. She's actually reading Goblet of Fire quite literally today. She's on, she's like, I think she has a hundred pages left. So yeah, it's really Oh my cool. gosh. Love it. <laughs> love it. All right. Question number two. We wanted to ask about an inflection point in your life that was especially memorable or meaningful. Yeah. So this is Laura. And I think I hope this isn't a stereotypical answer, but when I think about a meaningful and memorable experience in my life, it's funny. It all ties to JA. I've been with Junior Achievement for almost 14 years now, five years local, eight years national, and it's all because of one person. My mom ran into a a woman that had worked for her when she was in high school and college, and uh, Heather uh, is the lady's name, had just said, you know, 
did your daughter graduate? Like what's she up to? And my mom said, yeah, she just graduated looking for a job. And Heather said, well, tell her to reach out. You know, I run the local junior achievement office. And so that was my first job out of college. And aside from how great the organization has been, because it's been marvelous to me, I think working for Heather and just having that exposure of one, working in a professional setting and and just learning all of that, but seeing a woman, a, a girl boss, right? Like having that role model of my first female mentor and boss and seeing her in all these male dominated meetings and going into local factories and industries or CEO board meetings and presenting about JA and securing support and teaching me how to effectively run a meeting and how to communicate professionally. I just think having that experience right out of college was just pivotal and set me up for what I feel like has been a successful journey ever since. You know, I think about that chance encounter that my mom had uh, in seeing Heather at a grocery store and then what came from there. And I'm just so thankful for everything I learned from her and just really thankful for that. Brad, I love these new questions, man. This is amazing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. All right. Question number three, your favorite life hack. I like to carry around binder clips of different sizes and it's especially fun and great for when I travel. Like you think it's just for holding papers, but it goes so much beyond that. It can hold all my wires together, hold up my little baggie for my phone when I'm on the airplane watching a movie and even like I've used it for my hair. So definitely a great multi-use tip there. Okay. Baggy for your phone on the airplane. I'm going on an airplane tomorrow and I want to, I want to learn more about this. Tell me more. Oh, okay. So just take a little sandwich bag (laughs) and when you get on the airplane, you know, the little seat tray that's on the back, just take your phone, put it in the baggy and then you can either, it depends on like sometimes on the train, you use the binder clip to clip your baggy to that little pocket, but on a, an airplane, usually it's the tray. So you can insert the top part of the sealed Ziploc bag into the tray. So it'll kind of be wedged there and then your phone will be dangling out and you are hands-free. You can watch your phone and like I said, movies or play your games, whatever, without having your hands, you know, having to hold it the whole time. I feel like you have identified a true life. (laughs) Yeah, that's incredible. I would have never thought of that in a million years. I love that. I've seen it done and then I was like, hey, you know what? I'm going to try it myself and it works every time. (laughs) Love it. All right. Question number four, your biggest financial mistake. Yes, this is Laura. And I think when I look around and I'd love to be able to say, man, that over there that I bought was a big mistake. I actually think it's more personal. It was dating someone who had a bad financial history and um, learning the hard way that when you try to support someone and you feel like you can help them to fix up their finances, that does not always work. And that can come back to bite you pretty hard. So, um, Dating that person was the first biggest mistake, but then uh, letting them into my financial world was uh, a pretty big financial mistake I had to learn from. Question number five, the advice you would give your younger self. Yeah, this is Laura. So I think when I look at my younger self, I um, would say, don't ever think you can't do it. I think the older you get, you start to realize that people get sick every day and accidents and tragedies happen. And Uh, the value of having one life to live is really present. So whether it's to travel abroad or study abroad or take that internship or just moving away, just try it, like just try it. And you can always go back, but what if it takes off and what if it works and you're, you're ready to soar. So don't ever think you can't do it. Wow. Laura, I absolutely love that. Don't think you can't do it. Just try it. What if it works? What a great question to ask yourself. What if it works? All right. We have one last bonus question for you. In the last, let's say, roughly 12 months or so, what is the purchase you've made that's added the most value to your life? Yeah, so this is Crystal. I took the bullet and did a premium subscription on the Calm app. It's like a meditation mindfulness app. And so it was something I joined at the end of January. I tried it for free and there was just so much great content. It really helps me get into a daily meditation practice. I enjoy their sleep stories. So Upgrading to that premium subscription was the best thing I did all year, and I use it every day, so it's been awesome. Wow, that's fantastic. Amazing. Well, to both of you, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing the JA story with our audience. This has really been a pleasure. Thanks. We're thrilled to have been a part of it. We're so thankful for the new partnership that our organizations are working on together and um, really excited about what's to come. And again, to our audience, if, you would, if you're interested in working with us as we continue to try to help with junior achievement wherever possible to do that, you can go to chooseify.com slash JA. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. 
you've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.